and i think that's why dr vivek dave he is my colleague in lv prasad and he has got such an extensive experience in endoscopic surgery so i'll ask him to share his video with us dr dave on to you mudit uh, am i visible audible yeah all right uh, i hope i am full screen right now no not yet yeah now you are now all right so good afternoon everyone uh, i'll be presenting a case on endoscopic uh, iris cyst uh, iris cyst excision and uh, we'll go through some of uh, our old cases uh, about the experience that we've had in these situations so this particular case of mine was an 18 year old male marfanoid habitus left eye was lost to an old retinal detachment uh, was thysical and presently had an artificial eye in situ right i had a history of vr surgery with silicon oil in c2 elsewhere 2 years ago and he also had a cataract extraction done so it was a pseudophagic eye with a recurrent iris cyst and silicon oil in c2 he had undergone uh, two sittings of cyst aspiration and uh, sclerotherapy over the last one year but the cyst uh, recurred over the next few months so this is what the presentation was vision was uh, counting fingers close to face you can uh, see that there is an anteriorly displaced uh, iris the iris has ballooned anteriorly a lot like what an iris bombay looks like but it had this uh, bosseleted uh, appearance here and right in the visual axis uh, you can see this brownish translucent uh, reflex which was uh, representing the iris cyst due to a constant contact of the iris with the corneal endothelium there were multiple areas uh, where you can see haze due to localized uh, endothelial uh, decompensation uh, if you look at the slit photograph uh, of the slit lamp uh, in slit illumination this gives us a good idea of uh, the approximation or the apposition of uh, the iris surface uh, with the corneal endothelium this is what the b scan look like emulsified old oil in c2 now if you look at the anterior segment oct it beautifully delineates uh, how at multiple areas uh, the iris cyst uh, was uh, adherent to the corneal endothelium and uh, the anterior chamber subsequently had become very shallow so the clinical situation that we faced was a one eyed patient multiple vr surgeries already done uh, recurrent retinal detachment uh, which was present under oil as seen in the b scan a uh, recurrent iris iris cyst and a previously failed sclerotherapy done elsewhere on multiple occasions so in this situation uh, we planned for an endoscopic iris cyst excision and laser photocoagulation of the cyst base along with uh, uh, vr surgery for uh, the oil removal and repair of the retina Uh, the rationale for this was uh, the fact that if you go back and uh, look at uh, literature uh, in relation to iris cysts it is uh, notorious uh, for uh, recurrences and these recurrences occur because of uh, residual epithelial cells of the cyst which can propagate again over time and reform the cyst so if we have some way in which we can collapse or excise the cyst and also ensure that we don't leave behind any viable cells that would be the best way to ensure that there is no recurrence so this is how the uh, surgery proceeded first we had to tackle the anterior chamber so i'm filling the anterior chamber with viscoelastic and uh, doing a sort of a visco dissection between the iris and the corneal endothelium to uh, enlarge the anterior chamber space and uh, the observation that i have had uh, over the years is when one is doing this uh, the pressure that uh, uh, is transmitted back on the iris cyst because the cyst is taut many times causes the cyst to collapse so that uh, also if we do not uh, have this uh, specific approach of uh, going for the complete cyst excision may give us a false sort of uh, security that we have actually released or removed the cyst whereas actually the cyst has only collapsed so after having uh, done sort of uh, a synechial release uh, we now make an entry into the limbus and through the limbal entry go in with the endoscope so here in we will see that uh, there will be iris uh, visible what we saw here this is the pseudophagia this is the iris tissue up here and in between the iris tissue and the lens you will see another membrane which actually is the 
cyst wall and this cyst wall is being removed by a vitreous cutter so this needs to be removed completely right till its base so as to ensure that there is no reproliferation when we go completely close to the base there is a, a fear of injury to the ciliary body and hemorrhage from there that is the reason why once we remove this entire membrane the base instead of attempting an excision we photocoagulate it or because this is pigmented tissue this will take laser photocoagulation very well and a nice uh, photocoagulation at the base with confluent uh, uh, retinal uh, laser just like you do in a retinopathy of prematurity helps ensure all those cells are removed now this is what the uh, retina looked like it actually had a shallow retinal uh, detachment which was also taken care of in the same sitting so this is what we ended up with counting fingers had increased to 20 by 250 at 3 months so uh, this is the post treatment photograph just for understanding i will also put a pre treatment photograph uh, here so you see how the anterior chamber was shallowed at presentation and how nicely the iris has gone back has uh, uh, sort of to a great extent got its contour again and a nice deep anterior chamber with a pristinely clean cornea as of 3 months follow up Uh, these are uh, photos of a few other cases of uh, ours to the left if you see again as an iris cyst occluding the uh, pupillary axis this was a very young patient uh, one and a half years old this is what the patient ended up with once the cyst was removed another patient large uh, sort of uh, you know heart shaped cyst if you can call it with an extension around the iris towards the ciliary body root and again the post operative picture showing excellent results a third photograph very similar to the case just explained where the anterior chamber was completely shallow and iris opposed to the endothelium and after a complete cyst excision uh, the patient did well without having any recurrence and all these three uh, cases that i have shown are currently in our follow up uh, with a follow up duration of 9 months to 1 and 1/2 years uh, varying from patient to patient so i would say on the higher side we currently have a one and a half year uh, follow up of the patient not showing us any recurrence as of right now so thank you for your attention and uh, i'll be happy to take uh, questions if any thank you dr vivek great videos and so for all of Thanks your so uh, iris cysts now do you routinely think of preferring to going ahead with an endoscopic approach because it helps you in better visualization and probably when examining the ciliary body and any other residual areas which may probably be missed by a conventional surgery yeah so uh, one thing is uh, the cases are not very common yeah but what i have uh, understood right now also primarily with a lot of discussion with uh, you know rajiv rajiv reddy who is sort of pioneering uh, endoscopy at lvpi uh, the cysts that we see are usually in the setting of some sort of uh, violation of the eyeball so either it has to be a trauma or it has to be someone who has had uh, multiple uh, surgeries uh, very rarely uh, do we uh, see cysts which are uh, congenital most of them go to our uh, cornea services so in the subset that we see there is a possibility of the cyst component actually crossing the uh, edge of the pupil crossing the iris at the edge of the pupil this is when they are likely to have a component which is extending behind the iris if one sees a cyst which is very clearly restricted to the anterior chamber not really reaching to the pupillary margin in that situation the things that i just showed may not have relevance but if it is crossing the pupillary margin a conventional attempt to assist excision may lead to some amount of cyst wall remnant and that is where i think an endoscopic examination to exactly know what is the extent of it and if we see an extent there attempting to clear it and then laser the base would be helpful all right any comments from any of our panelists dr vivek are you using 20 gauge probe or are you using 23 gauge probe i oh. am largely oh. using a 20 gauge probe the surgery that i just showed was a 23 gauge but uh, for endoscopies in general if say the there is a foreign body or there is a lot of uh, hemorrhage inside the eye if i am attempting a vitreous hemorrhage 
I prefer a 20 gauge from the point of view of its camera being larger and giving a relatively larger field of view. It makes yes, uh, it a little more comfortable. Also, the 23 gauge uh, illumination actually is not very great. Sometimes even after putting an additional chandelier, the illumination is wanting and uh, it's a relative struggle as compared to a 20 gauge surgery. Very true. Uh, just a thing I'd like to add. Uh, 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 you need to have a better, uh, you know, video grab a card, then the quality of the video will be much better because I earlier had an Elgato basic uh, card and then you went on for a higher end card and that's made the, uh, the videos much more beautiful, much more rich in color and, and resolution also. For your endoscopic videos also, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for the endoscope only. Other, otherwise, so we have a normal yeah, camera on my exactly. camera, right? But the endoscope, so what I do is the, 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 the best video output we feed it into the card and that goes into the laptop hmm. rather than trying to grab it from uh, 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 the uh, the composite video. Okay, So the composite video has the RGB channels, the red, green and blue channels, <clears throat> but that is a lower resolution, lower quality video. So the uh, the endoscopic system, uh, the, the, uh, the endoptic system that, we, yeah, yeah, which we're the using. endoptic C4. Yeah, they, they are the only ones you who have this. So the endoptic uh, system has an S video output also. So you should you uh, take that S video output, feed it into the Elgato uh, or the, whichever video card you have, and then uh, feed it into the laptop. So that's what we are doing. So I actually use my laptop with the video card rather than using monitor which they have given. That monitor we have removed. So that's it's. Uh, I mean, I if anybody wants, I can show you the samples of the video that we have. I think thank you for that input. I think that's an important input because uh, case to case, if you compare uh, the endoscopy related videos, uh, cut a sorry figure with respect to clarity as against uh, you know, any of the conventional uh, surgical recordings. Thank you. A couple of uh, questions, uh, Dr. Dave. Very good videos. Um, one is that you know the, some of them have corneal opacity and that's the reason you might do it for a retinal surgery. So post-operatively, how do you monitor these patients because you can't see the retina? And second question is, supposing you decide for a corneal surgery, do you do it after you have removed the silicone oil, then again reassess the um, stability, each of these last two procedures again with endoscope and then do a corneal transplant or would you just transplant with oil in situ? Yeah, I think uh, excellent questions both. Uh, coming to the first part of the question, say once you operate, uh, I, I understand you are talking in terms of, uh, say, for example, a retinal detachment or a posterior segment pathology with, uh, with an opaque cornea. So you you will not get any opportunity to see what things what okay. the things are in the post-op. Mm -hmm. So in this situation, we actually, after having uh, done the surgery, especially if it's an oil-filled surgery, uh, you know, where even the B scan doesn't give us good amount of purchase. You just have to take a leap of faith, uh, monitor the uh, IOP. And if, say, if the IOP is not going down, it largely tends to tell you that possibly the retina is uh, attached. And it is just at the point of silicone oil removal, when you see inside again, is when you will actually realize whether the things have really worked out or not. Over the years, I uh, have been staging it uh, completely in the sense the second is a standalone silicone oil removal then again have the patient in your follow-up ensure that the retina doesn't you know detach which again you can only monitor on the b scan and then thus then as a third stage the uh, cornea person comes in and does the graft uh, as appropriate yeah. I would feel or I would assume that this not only ensures that uh, what you are doing step by step is going in the right direction uh, combining the SOR and the uh, keratoplasty in the same go, uh, the cornea group is of the opinion that it may uh, sort of, you know, have an effect on the corneal endothelium and their grafts may go down. So that is the reason I would be keen to you know, stage them uh, over. And so, so the entire process, it's important to explain to the patients that the entire thing is going to go on for at least four to six months before they see any you know, flicker of uh, vision per se. Because after every procedure, they would expect that something will change. It is not going to change till months down the line, the keratoplasty comes uh, in place. Exactly. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opinions or any input or other to panelists, Dr. Mahesh, Dr. Ale Bankar? No, no. I have beautiful videos, Vivek. Uh, uh, no, I have uh, no experience on uh, endoscopy. How is the learning curve for endoscopy? Uh, in, uh, in endoscopic uh, surgery training? 
yeah i think there is a good amount of learning curve i'm sure mm. rajiv lost a lot of hair while trying to yeah. teach me and no Udhid, i don't have uh, any hair skill so I <laughs> right mm. yeah no there is a definite learning curve sir the most important thing is that there is no stereopsis like what we see in a yeah. conventional vr system we have a birds eye view where we are seeing from top to down what happens in an endoscope is you have got an end on view so you only visualize the area which is under the focus of your endoscopy probe mm. and there are no stereopsis clues over there you don't so that lack of stereopsis and this difficulty in orientation takes time to get used to it but over a period of time you do develop looking at adjusting certain clues your blood vessels how you are approaching and then you can go ahead and do it i mean like what vivek said dr rajiv reddy was the one who started it and we have all kind of learned from him me and vivek have both been his students and he is the one who started and taught most of it to us